Good evening. I appreciate these crowds staying so late tonight. I practice in the heartworm endemic area. We see a lot of heartworms. And probably the thing that frustrates me most of all is the simple fact that um, after 30 years in practice, and despite all the great heartworm preventives out there, and despite all my efforts to educate, I still see as many cases of heartworms now as I did 30 years ago. And that's frustrating. Certainly in, in my lifetime, I've seen, and probably you have too, seen heartworms spread from being a southeastern problem and a Gulf Coast state problem to be a problem in every state in the continental United States and, of course, Hawaii. So it's a big concern for us. And, and the problem with heartworms, and I wish they would go away, is that once, they're, once a pet's diagnosed with heartworms, there's no good answer anymore. You know? If we do nothing, they'll get more heartworms. Disease will continue to progress. They will spread uh, heartworm infection to their neighbors and back to itself. There's no good answer there. If we do soft kill, and I'm certainly not a proponent of soft kill, nor is any speaker here, nor is the American Heartworm Society. And I say that because clinically, in my practice, I see problems. And I've seen, and I know the statistics say that they will all be negative by two and a half years. This summer, I confirmed the presence of adult heartworms in the pulmonary artery of a, of a dog that had been on soft kill for three years. So not a good thing. I see dogs a year or two years into um, soft kill die of congestive heart failure. When the worms don't go away quickly, we find that the disease continues to progress, and that can have a bad outcome. So option number two is not a very good option. We look at option number three, we're talking about adult side treatment. Adult side treatment is, has some negatives too. There's no good answer there. We're gonna kill a whole bunch of heartworms and we're gonna put them down those arteries. And we're gonna create obstructive disease and thromboemboli. So not a great option either. And I guess if we could get um, a great cardiac surgeon to go in and surgically, surgically remove the worms, maybe that would be a good option. But the bottom line is there is no good answer. If we look at, if we look at the American Heartworm Society guidelines, um, that adult side protocol, despite the fact that we're killing worms, is probably the best option. We're eliminating worms as quickly as possible. Um, we're stopping the progression of disease. And because the protocol has been really so wonderfully designed, we really don't see much clinical evidence of emb embolic disease. I used to worry a lot. I used to see about a third of my cases develop complications of heartworm treatments. Anymore, I can't hardly remember a complication to a heartworm treatment, and it's because of that protocol. So when we look at heartworms and trying to deal with them, I think, I know I'm pushing the right button. The right answer is a medicide. We've got to do an adulticide treatment. We've got to get rid of the worms. The good thing about imidacide is it puts us in control of the heartworm treatment. Now, imidacide is not caparsalate. Caparsalate, the old raw arsenic we used to use, caused liver damage and kidney damage. If you got some out of the vein, it would slough the skin off the leg. It was a horrible, horrible uh, treatment. And I think if you could look at those dogs today, you would still find that those dogs have high levels of, of arsenic in their liver. Uh, not a great product. And if we could say that there's such a thing as a friendly arsenical, I would say it probably would be called melarsamine. Melarsamine, if you don't know this, is completely eliminated from the body in six to eight hours. Very rapidly eliminated. Most of it in the stool, unchanged parent compound, but some metabolites in the stool and the rest of the metabolites in the urine. It's in and out of the body in six to eight hours. So I, do I worry about giving a shot of a product that's gonna be out of the body in six to eight hours? A lot less so than I used to be worried about caparsalate. When we utilize prednisone and maxitic lactones and the cycling antibiotics in treating with the American Heartworm Society protocol, the wonderful thing is we minimize complications. And we're in control of that because we know um, exactly where the status of the worms are. When we use imidacide, when we use melarsamine, we know the time frame of worm death. The worms are gonna die 10 to 14 days, maybe some a little bit after that, but they die in that time frame. And we restrict a pet's activity during that time frame. So we minimize the complications to a heartworm treatment by doing all these things. We know the efficacy of, of melarsamine. The efficacy is wonderful. One shot kills 50% of the worms, we know that. 80% of the males, 20% of the females. 
Two injections will kill virtually 90% of the worms. Three injections, split treatment, will ultimately kill 98 plus percent of the worms. And so we know the efficacy. So the beautiful thing about utilizing malarsamine in the treatment of heartworms is that we're in control. We're not in control with anything else we do, but we're in control of when those worms die, the activity level of the pet, we have medications on board that prevent complications. And so if we're truly going to do things right, we need to use imidacide. Now, it doesn't mean that imidacide doesn't have any problems. It is an arsenical. It's, it does have side effects. Probably one of the more common side effects I see is anxiousness, panting, and restlessness. And when I first started using imidacide, I found that people would call me up at the end of the day, and say, or near the end of the day, and say, something's not right. He's painful. He's pacing. He's panting. He's restless. He can't stay still. Um, I would say, come in. Let me take a look. They weren't painful at all. They were panting and restless and anxious, and obviously the arsenical has some type of, I don't know, flushing effect or some type of effect on the pet that makes them pant and pace and be anxious. It goes away in six to eight hours, and so if you say, it'll be okay, he'll be fine in the morning, it's true because it goes away as soon as the um, imidacide leaves the body. Six to eight hours, all those signs go away. Pain and swelling probably is the number one complication we see to the use of imidacide. It doesn't hurt when you give it, but it's one of those shots that, boy, did the nurse hit the bone. Um, it will hurt you the next day. And so we worry a lot about that, and we try to do everything we can to prevent pain and swelling. There are reports of sterile abscesses, very caustic medication. If you give it to subcutaneous tissues, what you will find is that you will create a sterile, abs sterile abscess. If you give it in the kidney, and using a long needle in a small dog can get you to the kidney, and there are reports of sterile abscesses in kidneys, and retroperitoneal abscesses, and so you've got to administer it properly. Um, otherwise, you can see pretty devastating problems. The spinal cord obviously does not like malarcy. If you give it too close to the spinal cord, if the dog jumps, the needle angles over, and you administer it close to the spinal cord, you can cause paresis and paralysis. I've never seen that. Pulmonary edema, that's not something I've ever seen either. But if you give too high a dose of malarsamine, you can create an issue with pulmonary edema. Twice the dose is pretty toxic. So you're looking at um, a little dog getting 0.3 cc's and you miscalculate and give them 0.6 and it doesn't seem like that big a volume. But that twice the dose will cause pulmonary edema in a lot of those pets, or some of those pets. And some of those pets will die. So not good. So we can see death from uh, imidacide. We see death from sterile abscesses. We can see death from paresis. We can see pulmonary edema cause death. Um, but there's one other thing. And this is interesting because I didn't know this until it happened to one of my associates. If you give it intravenously, it will cause death. Now, it's 100% effective in eliminating heartworms, but at a very high cost. Um, obviously, there are venous sinuses, there are blood supply in the epaxial muscles. She did not aspirate. She injected drug, and the, dr the pet basically fell off the end of the needle. So make sure to aspirate when you give that product, and it's a, it's a horrible thing to see. So there are consequences. So make sure the two things we have to do to give it safely, one is to dose it accurately. Opposite of giving too much is giving too little. 10%, once you get below 10% underdosing, it loses its effectiveness tremendously. So you see, you can see a pet if you underdose by less than 10%, who doesn't clear of heartworm. So make sure that you dose it correctly. Proper administration, it's got to be given in the apaxial muscle. The reason they chose that muscle, the apaxial muscle is a good meaty muscle. It's covered by fascia, it's got a great blood supply so it can carry drug out of it. It's really a good target for us to use. If you administer um, malarsamine in the muscle and back leg, they'll limp for a month if they don't develop sterile abscess and a problem. And so the apaxial muscle is the target muscle. IV administration is fatal, I will re remind you of that. Um, Couple hints for kind of minimizing the potential complications we can see. Um, change the needle. You know, draw it out of the bottle, you probably do this. Change the needle. Two things happen there. One is you don't have residual drug on the needle that you'll track through the skin, subcutaneous fat, and into the, um, then into the muscles. Um, but number two, when we look at a sharp, the sharpness of the needle, if you want to make a pet jump and move and squirm, start out with a dull needle. You'll hurt them. So use a sharp needle and maybe they'll hold a little more still for you. Use an appropriate needle size. Um, the needle size uh, recommended in the package insert is a one and a half inch 22 gauge needle. 
I don't know why they didn't say or something else, but that's a mighty big needle for a 10 pound dog. I will say I will often use a um, 23 gauge one inch needle for little dogs and calculate accordingly. Keep the pets standing when you administer your shots. You know, I find that I've tried all kinds of things to keep them still. Every time I try to give a shot to a dog who's sitting, they try to stand up and they squirm. And so it's hard to keep a dog from standing up. But if you have them standing and you give them a prick and they try to sit down, a good technician can hold that pet standing so you don't have as much movement. And it's very important not to have movement. Find your target. Target is, look at your spinous process of your vertebrae. I'll put my finger there. I'll put my finger on the lateral aspect of the apaxial muscles. I'll calculate where the center of that, that apaxial muscle should be. I'll calculate for how much fat is there and how deep I think I should go in order to get it in the proper location. And I administer it at an angle, um, aspirate, and inject slowly. Don't be afraid to stop. You get a dog and you're halfway into it and all of a sudden he starts wiggling and squirming it's appropriate to stop giving it. I think if you don't, I think you do risk, of course, giving it towards the spinal cord or giving it subcutaneous fat and certainly prompting a lot more problems. So stop, restart again and do it. I don't sedate pets for uh, amidocide. I've sedated one pet that uh, couldn't be contained otherwise. But in my career, I've only sedated the one. So if you feel like sedation to hold a pet still is appropriate, it's appropriate to do so. Limits the dose of sight dosage per site to two cc's. Sometimes you're dealing with a big Labrador and you need four cc's of, of, of um, melarsamine. That's a lot of, of, of caustic agent to put in one site. Split it into two sites. You know, I'll do left side one day, I'll do right side the other. So if they get one shot and it's always on the left, if I give two shots, the first one's on the left, the second one's on the right. That keeps a nice little um, um, uh, monitor for what my office does. If I'm not the one doing the second shot, they know they got to go on the right side. So it makes it pretty simple. But yeah, limit the dose to two cc's per injection site. Apply pressure as you withdraw the needle. I apply pressure for about a minute and it's just to keep the backflow of that um, caustic agent from getting into the subcutaneous tissues. And we're in pretty good shape. I do try to do th two things with the client. I try to inform them of the panning and the anxiousness and tell them, if you see that, don't worry, it's not pain. It's just a flushing effect or some way the drug makes them feel, and that'll go away soon. Expect some soreness. We do expect soreness with this, despite what you do. But keep in mind, if you have the pet on prednisone, prednisone is anti-inflammatory. That helps to reduce the inflammation associated with melarsamine tr dramatically. Um, if you're not using prednisone, your heartworm treatments, you need to start using prednisone. It's one of the greatest things for reducing inflammation related to embolic events and um, uh, melarsamine that you can get. So use prednisone. Dispense medication for discomfort otherwise. You know, pick your poison. It can't be, I, I typically don't use non anti-inflammatories because I never use those with uh, a glucocorticoid. So because they're on prednisone, I choose something else. Choose your favorite, you know, whatever you like. I like, sometimes I'll use Tylenol number three, some gabapentin, um, pick, pick your favorite. Um, soreness, if it does occur, usually I've never seen it uh, last longer than two or three days. So we expect good things. And when we do good things, we do get good results. So thank you.